And now into the session we are waiting for. I'd like to introduce the speaker for the day, Roisin Lennon. She's going to make a presentation entitled Changing the Face of Midwifery Care Through Advanced Practice in 21st Century Ireland. Roisin is a midwife and mother with friends and family all over the world. Currently living and working in Ireland as a registered advanced midwife practitioner, but worked in Scotland as a midwife for many years. Privileged to be a midwife and part of so many families' pregnancy journey. Special interest in aromatherapy and ref reflexology and post-date pregnancy treatments. And she's also an IBCLC, that's lactation consultant. She's been involved in many audits and research projects and have been um, have had a few articles published. Currently, learning Spanish to keep the brain active with the hope of being able to travel again and put the lessons to good use. Rosin, you're most welcome. Thank you, Carol, and thanks for that lovely introduction. And thank you, everybody, and thanks, VIDM, for the opportunity for speaking today. It's a great privilege to be part of this great International Day of the Midwife. So I'm starting off. I know the theme for, for this conference is birth equity for all. And starting on my first bit, I like to think that part of my role is to empower women on their journey to motherhood. And within that, I love this Michelle O'Donnell um, phrase, to change the world, we must first change the way the babies are being born. And currently in Ireland, we're on a big, big change into rolling out midwifery-led care and expanding the whole service because up to now it's kind of been an obstetric model with a small input to um, midwifery care. So it's exciting times in Ireland. And she's given us the title and that's just the hospital where I work. So I'd like to say that I have no conflicts of interest. I would also like to apologize if I am not totally gender inclusive and I talk about females and not the pregnant person. To be fair, at the moment, all the ladies that have been through my service do identify as females, but I knew, do know that that's not always the case around the world, so I hope I don't offend anybody. This study that I'm going to talk to you about is part of my yearly key performance indicator that I have to do within the hospital to show what the outcomes are of the ladies that come through my, my service. And I've drilled down it further just to benchmark it against the Cochrane Data um, Review of 2016, looking at continuity care for midwifery models. So just to benchmark it against something that's been out there before and to see where I'm going along in that pathway. For those that don't know Sligo or Ireland, Sligo is on the northwest. If you're into English literature, it is W.B. Yeats has done a lot of his writings here and his poems. And we have been in a lockdown no more than the rest of the world and limited to five kilometres since Christmas. It's just extended to county level. And we've been very blessed in that within our 5K, we have this wonderful walk that you go up through some woods, up a little hill, well, decent enough hill, and you're looking out over Ballisadair Bay, Sligo Bay, and out the Atlantic Ocean. So it's been a walk that I've done with my, my husband and my poor fourth year student um, daughter who has been home from Glasgow for the last year at the table. So we've been very lucky. So if you ever do get a chance to come and visit Sligo, it rains a lot, but it is some fantastic scenery and some beautiful beaches. So to put where I am at, perspective advanced practice around the world is very different so i'm going to just give a little background so that you know where i'm coming from and what my remit entails and like i said because i know it changes within countries so my service is based on local service needs advanced practice in ireland be it nursing or midwifery has to take a complete episode of care from admission to discharge and the whole idea is actually promoting wellness healthcare choices and you work within a specific caseload that has agreed inclusion criteria. You have clinical guidelines or other policies to govern your practice. And what you're doing is that you're working within the midwifery philosophy of care, but at an advanced level, using advanced clinical knowledge, critical thinking and decision making abilities. And that's all based within codes of conduct from the Nursing and Midwifery Board of Ireland. 
and then that's just the flavour. It's two years minimum post-graduation, educated to a master's degree. You have to get 500 supervised clinical hours within your area that you're going to be working at the advanced level. You have a medication prescriptive authority. So within my practice, I have a big list of drugs that I can prescribe, which really covers all eventualities of the ladies coming to my caseload. And for advanced nurses, they have to have ionizing radiation prescribing as well. Now, when I went to register, I know it was questioned and they did ask, would I, you know, why didn't I have that? But I have to say, as a midwife, even as an advanced midwife practitioner, if any of my ladies are needing to get an X-ray or to go through a CT machine or an MRI, they're needing even more input than an obstetrician. So I just feel that, no, that is definitely totally outside it. So I don't have that. So there's five domains that govern advanced practice. And these are the same five domains that are set down for the registered general nurse and registered midwife, but it's just at the extra level of care and um, autonomy that's extended scope of practice. So within the respect for the dignity of the person is you're looking at the self-determination of the individual, that your care is in partnership with the woman. Again, like your professional responsibility is like no other codes, it's same codes around the world that you're responsible for your actions, inactions and omissions. Your quality of practice is to be safe, quality, cost effective service and demonstrating leadership within that practice. The trust and confidentiality rolls out to the service users, the maternity team and the advanced midwife practitioner working as the link and the patient advocate between all members of the team and the other specialities. And then collaboration with others, basically for the goal that we want is that we've got a good outcome from mom and baby. Taking into that then, within your job description, which you develop to suit and reflect what your advanced practice is, there are six core concepts. And they're as detailed before. And to put it into context with me, I work within the midwifery philosophy of care. Advanced practice means that I've been able to stay as a clinical hands-on midwife with a career pathway moving forward and extending my knowledge and my base on my services. The focus is on health and well-being, it's evidence-based practice, person-centered, individualized and tailored care to the woman. But like I said before, working at that higher level of thinking and decision making. So the professional values and conducts no more than anything is that you're accountable and responsible within the boundaries of your job description, your inclusion criteria, that you have timely referrals to and from the service and discussions with the family, the women and the clinical team that are other team members that are involved in our care. Clinical decision making means that I have to be able to take a full his undertake a full physical examination as required. I can order tests, investigations, and then by putting them all together, interpreting them and then care planning with the right therapeutic interventions which could be looking at just health care changes. It could be prescribing medicines, just depending on what the findings are. The knowledge and cognitive competencies look at leadership, that you're the lead expert within your service, that you're involved in research and audit, education and ongoing um, continual professional development and evolving the service as needs be. Communication and personal competencies go within the healthcare um, professionals, the obstetric team, the women and the family, other specialities. And within Sligo, we're very lucky in that we've got a, a range of specialities that, you know, most times as clinical nurse specialists that you can pick up the phone to and refer the ladies very, very quickly to. So respiratory nurse specialists, if I've got a lady that asthma is playing up, the diabetic nurses, it's just fantastic. It's so seamless and so flow through. It's brilliant altogether. Um, man, or don't know that, sorry, leadership and professional scholarship competencies then are evolving the service, identifying the gaps, implementing change and evaluating. And that's done through collection of um, key performance indicators that are set into the job description and also undertaking audit and research into the service. So putting it all together then, um, care is as per the three C's that are set down by Nursing and Midwifery Board of Ireland, and that's for all nurses and midwives, and that's that you're practising within compassion, care and commitment. And I think that reflects around the world wherever people are working. And the previous slides are just put together that basically this is what my, my care is all about. It's the safety and autonomy of the woman, respecting her choices, values and beliefs, responsible and accountable, 
safe, compassionate, respectful care, equal partnership with the women and communicating and collaborating with the woman and the multidisciplinary team. And that is basic standards of advanced practices set down by the Nursing and Midwifery Board of Ireland. And to put into context, I have clinical guidelines and just that's how strict and, and sort of governed that the practice is that I have one that tells, you know, supports how I will telephone a lady and give her information, how I will do my physical assessment. So it governs all bits of practice. So as long as you're working within the job description and your clinical guidelines and your inclusion criteria, your practice is safe and it's safe for the woman as well. So it's brilliant. And then the accountability areas are a little bit different than other branches in that you're professionally accountable to the director of midwifery, obviously to the nursing and midwifery board, the service users in public and the laws of the land. I forgot to put that one in. And you're clinically accountable to consultant obstetricians. So just a different little bit of way of working than, than you'd normally be as a midwife. And this, this quote I just love. It's birth is not only about making babies. Birth is about making mothers strong, competent, capable mothers who trust themselves and know their inner strength. And I think that, you know, at the end of the day, that's what's about that you're, you know, empowering the woman on her journey and you're doing this so that you've got a mum who's taken a baby home and hopefully having a very satisfied experience of her care and moving forward to take her family on through the next step. So the AMP service was introduced into Sligo in 2017. Like I said, it's a complete episode of care and I take a medium risk um, pregnancies, which in Ireland is set out as assisted care pathway. Usually within midwifery care, it's normal risk and that in Ireland is known as supported care. I first meet the ladies at about 18 to 22 weeks and I take them through to postnatal discharge. Um, I have admission and discharge rights to the services. Like I said before, I can prescribe medication. I have referral pathways to all specialities within the service and close links with the multidisciplinary team. Now, where the service does fall down at times is I work Monday to Friday just. So if any of the service users come in at the weekend, then they fall under the remit of the on-call obstetric team. And then just a flavour of what my caseload looks like, just to benchmark it against where people that are working as midwives are saying, well, what's different with advanced practice? is that I take a slightly extremer edges of ages, so 16 to 45. Um, I started off with stable medical conditions, and if then they needed changing of medication, like say thyroid medicines, that then they would revert back to the consultant. But within the links with the other areas, some of the consultant physicians were like going, well, Roshin, why is this lady going back to the obstetrician? Sure, I'm minding her for thyroid or diabetes, you know, I'm looking after that, you're looking after our pregnancy. So we brought it back and that did change. Gestational diabetics and diet group B strep. You can see them there. So it just puts into a little bit of perspective. And the other little bit that I take as where well is that there is a midwife led antenatal clinic. They take the ladies up to 39 weeks. And before I started the service, they would have gone back to consultant care for post dates and planning. But they come to me now and then if they're needing induction, I take all that. Or sometimes they fall out the, the support to care pathway and they move into medium risk. They sometimes transfer care to me. So it works nicely. It's great. I love it. So that's a long winded bit of what advanced practice is. But I felt it does just benchmarking and it was relevant. So what was my study about? That's what I'm here to talk about, basically, not just about the other bits. So. What, like I said, for part of the key performance indicators is to look at the birth outcomes and other bits for the service users. And most years, what I do is I benchmark it. I take what the sort of births, different things, and benchmark it against the rest of the maternity unit within the hospital. But like I said, this time I wanted to just drill it down against the Cochrane Data Review for primary and secondary outcomes to midwifery-led care. And I benchmark it against a similar caseload of ladies that were attending for obstetric-led care as per my inclusion criteria. And for those that I'm sure you're all familiar, but just a wee recap what that those primary and secondary outcomes are, it looks at the birth outcomes as in, you know, usually there's higher um, vaginal birth rates, uh, there's lower epidural rates, more intact perineums and less babies born preterm. And then the secondary outcome that that um, Cochrane Review came out with, there was less labour interventions, less use of analgesia in labour, perineal tears, postpartum hemorrhages, breastfeeding rates, APGAR scores less than seven at five minutes, um, birth weights less than 2.5, resuscitation and NICU admissions. So it's just putting against all of that. So the study was a 
oh, apologies, I didn't go forward. The study was a retrospective study. It took place from the 1st of November 2019 to the end of November 2020. It was anonymized data and it was taken from the maternity information record. Now, the record we have is very nice. You can do a stat generator. You can put in what criteria you want and you can pull it over onto spreadsheets so you don't actually link it back to um, PCNs or hospital numbers and then you can um, benchmark against the different bits. So we included everybody that had come to my service and that include that came to 324 women and they were ladies that had the full episode of care through me so i discounted the ladies that came at 39 weeks and onwards from the midwifery led care or ladies that have been transferred to obstetric care someplace through the pregnancy when we did the stat generator through the maternity information record we pulled out 672 ladies that had similar caseload and data so we decided that we would put them all in because if we tried to sift them down we might lose some of that and as we were using percentages comparing it that we felt that was a truer reflection of what was going on and like i said we excluded the supported care and all the rest so the breakdown the parity the purple lines are the advanced practice service and the green is the obstetric led service and the obstetric led service means that like myself, they would see the ladies, the care is shared between the ladies general practitioner and at the clinics then it could be a different obstetrician they see each time, it could be a junior, it could be senior, it could be the consultant just depending and they would have a midwife that checks in, does their obs and that's a midwifery input with us. so just to put it into perspective. So between the parities they were very similar spread out. The age ranges, again, I had slightly more with me, so I had 20% of ladies were over 40. And I know that for the obstetric leg care, that sort of 30 to 35 group had a higher bit, but on the whole, they were fairly similar and evenly spread. Um, and just within the cohort group, and for those that are very quick to calculate things, you'll realize that the numbers don't add up to 100. Excuse me, and that is basically because some ladies had two things going on. So they might have had BMI and anxiety and depression. They might have had BMI and GDM. So it was just to give a flavor of what's looking. And between them, fairly similar, except I know for my service, I had more ladies that had anxiety, depression. Some of them were on medication, some of them weren't, and similar to the obstetric led care. But the rest of the ones were fairly similar between the underlying medical problems, the previous postpartum hemorrhages, the group B streps, all that. The data analysis, like I said, we captured it from the data generation. We looked at them, we did numbers and percentages. To do a statistical um, analysis, there was nobody in the hospital does it. So I was very lucky in that my daughter is um, finishing off her finance and business and she helped it and her friend who is a credit risk analyst he did also the the data and between the two of them they numbered crunched they came up with exactly the same statistics and it was actually very interesting the conversations because they hadn't a clue of what i was looking for and um, i really didn't have a whole lot of a clue of all these great big logistic regressions that was getting bandied about but at the end of the day the numbers proved what it was and came out and so it was interesting and a nice steep learning curve for me and we took a p-value of less than 0 0.05 and again then obviously anything that was less than 0 0.001 was really really statistically significant so the results when we looked at the primary results as you can see breaking down statistically there was similar vaginal birth rates this was a bit that threw me and that's where there was numbers but i was told the numbers can't lie so that if the stats are driving it and saying that the probability was less than 0 0.01 that was down to the numbers and that the obstetric led care actually came out better than that. The MP service had higher instrumental birth rates and the emergency cesarean section rate was less with myself. Regional analgesia use was less. Intact perineums were very similar and preterm births were less for those coming through the AMP care service. For the secondary outcomes then, induction of labour was less for AMP care and um, induction of labour resulting in cesarean section was fairly similar. And when we drill down into that, the actual induction of labours that ended up in sections for within my caseload were more ladies that were post dates, or there was probably 40 to 50 percent of them had had prolonged rupture of membranes that went on to have a cesarean section. Whilst within the obstetric led group, most of the ladies were less than 40 weeks gestation and had various reasons for induction, like 
previous quick labours, maternal requests, different things. So it was just an interesting breakdown. There was less sort of amniotomies done within the AMP group, but wasn't statistically significant. Less use of oxytocin, similar rates of no analgesia. More ladies used Entinox only in the AMP group, and the opioid use only was less within the AMP group than in the obstetric led group. Also from that, then, the perineal tears within the two groups were fairly similar, but the episiotomy rate was slightly less in the AMP group, which that was even considering that the instrumental delivery rate was higher, was interesting. And the third degree tears were very similar as well, but the PPH loss less or more than a thousand mils was less within the AMP group. For the babies then, there was more ladies initiated breastfeeding at birth in the AMP group. The breastfeeding at discharge was higher in the AMP group, but again, wasn't statistically significant. And um, birth weights was, was, there was more babies born over 2.5 kilos in the AMP group. Apgars less than seven were fewer in the AMP group and the resuscitation rates were fewer as well. And the neonatal intensive care admission rates were fewer. The vaginal birth after cesarean section doesn't come into the midwifery-led care um, Cochrane review, but I put it in there because it is part of my caseload. Um, as I put in, I think there was 18 ladies in total attended my caseload for um, that had a previous cesarean section and were aiming to have a vaginal birth. Um, out of the ones that didn't attempt it, three ladies were um, breech. And obviously that was a repeat elective section. And one lady at 38 weeks was all for having a vaginal birth, but at 38 weeks, just something just said no. So she asked for an elective section. Out of then the ladies that did go on to labour, there was an 85% rate that did achieve it. And the ones that didn't um, have a vaginal birth, there was various things between meconium, maybe scar pain, maybe bleeding was in the obstetric led group, there was only 58% of the ladies that, that actually achieved a vaginal birth. So experiences have clearly shown that an approach which demedicalizes birth, restores dignity and humanity to the process of childbirth and returns control to the mother. And that is shown to be the safest approach. And that again is Michelle O'Dent. And like that, I think that's sort of what I'm trying to do to give that back to women. Yes, obviously, you know, if more people have a vaginal birth, yes, that's probably the goal in a lot of studies. But I have to say from my philosophy, if a lady has a satisfying experience, even the ladies that opt to have an elective section after the vaginal birth, but they leave the hospital feeling that they've been listened to, that they've had choice, that they've had good care and that they're going home to move forward minding a baby and look after a family. I think that's really what it's all about. But again, it's you know just trying to get everybody safe. So what do all these mean? So benchmarking it against the Cochrane Review, there were similar findings in that there was lower preterm births and lower epidural rates and the intact perineum rate was similar. But what was different was the, the spontaneous vaginal birth rate was similar. The instrumental rates were higher within the AP group but the emergency cesarean section rates were less within the group. Secondary outcomes similar was that there was less artificial rupture of membranes, less episiotomies and perineal tears were, were, were similar, but I think the third degree tears overall, there was less that required suturing and the similar opioid uh, rates. The difference was that there was actually lower induction of labor rates. And again, that might be different to the Cochrane Review because, you know, traditionally are the midwives in that care then going on to induce ladies. And that was something that I just didn't really drill down um, thoroughly with, but probably did look for the birth outcomes first. There was lower oxytocin rate. And again, like I, as I always say, once you add in oxytocin to the equation and something goes wrong, that's where everything seems to just tie back onto that. So, you know, less oxytocin is often the, is obviously better lower postpartum hemorrhage rates. And again, you know, that's going to affect, you know, going home, breastfeeding, all the rest. And then, like I said, similar no analgesia rates. So they were different to the Cochrane reviews. For the babies, it was very different in that there was less babies at Apgars, less than seven, less babies requiring resuscitation. And interestingly, the babies that needed resuscitation weren't always the ones in the emergency cesarean section rate, um, group, sorry. 
the less NICU admission rates and then the higher breastfeeding rates. What does that mean then? Well, spec to me at the end of it, it means that it does show that it does work, that you can roll out a similar continuity of care model um, against an, an upper level of risk ladies and um, just using advanced midwifery practice. So it's something that could be looked at and developed, but it's certainly it's made a difference with our unit and certainly going back to the theme of this year's conference, equity for all. It's not equity for all, but it's offering choice and a little bit of difference and expanding midwifery model of care and philosophy to more women than what it did before. Um, the AMP care is less interventions. So I expect if you're looking at cost effective and keeping things normal, that certainly comes into it. And then the baby outcomes exceed the findings from the others. So again, you know, less separations of mummies and babies, less stress at mum at the initial point of delivery, because you all know even if the baby's lying on mum's chest and it's crying, she's always still going to say, is it okay, is it okay? But obviously if you have to take it away to the resuscitator and do extra bits, that's a whole different ball game and extra stress levels from everybody. The strengths that we kind of pulled from it was that, and this is where it, we could have had even better rates or maybe worse, I don't know, but all the ladies come in through our obstetric led delivery suite unit. So it's core labor ward staff and midwives that look after them. If there's things that need um, reviewed, it is on the on-call obstetric team that usually make the decisions. So again, both groups were subjected to similar care and you know the lottery of that core labor ward staff. So that was kind of doing that little bit. The demographics of women were very similar and the cohort of women were similar. Yes, there was just about the double of amount in the obstetric led care, but like I said, we didn't sift them down just so that we could compare it more accurately. Then you might just lose certain different cohorts and, and different bits. The limitations with it was that, you know, it was a retrospective as opposed to prospective. The other bit is the input of what goes into the maternity information record. You're relying on that being accurate because we certainly didn't pull a thousand charts to go trailing through. So some of that input might have been not accurate. I know for my own stats, I you know that certainly from what I would do from keeping a record was similar to what I pulled from the stats generator. So I know from that that was fairly accurate. And the other bit is then the obstetric led care. Like I said before, there's different levels of experience and expertise of the obstetricians looking after the women that are coming through that. Whilst the ladies that were coming to me, it was the same person that they were seeing each visit. I am not anti-obstetric um, team because we all have a great big place to play, but I do have to say I like this quote. So the midwife considers the miracle of childbirth as normal and leaves it alone unless there's trouble. The obstetrician normally sees childbirth as trouble if he leaves it alone. It's a miracle. I have to thank all these people. And at the top, I certainly have to thank the women who have opted for AMP care in Sligo. Because when we started off, people were like, oh, but sure, I have to see the doctor. I have to see the obstetrician. You know, oh, midwife can't mind it. But as women have come through the pathway, the best bit now, I have to say, is women are actively seeking, looking to see, can they come to the service? So that, that's great in itself. And I have to thank the consultant obstetricians because without their support and the director of midwifery and Miss McDermott, who's now retired because she started the ball rolling without them, I wouldn't be where I am here today. So, you know, it's all part of a team. They're the kind of key core members. And then, like I said, the rest of the midwives within the unit, the healthcare workers, everybody that's in the team is just part of it. So I'd like to say thank you very much for listening to me. Um, I'd love to take any questions or comments. And what I would really, really love to ask and find out from people if they wanted to put it into the chat box is, you know, are you guys working as autonomous midwives? Are you working within an obstetric led um, care model? Is there advanced practice within your areas? And what else? And they're just little bits I'd love to know. And I'm happy to take any questions. There's loads of comments. I haven't had time to look at them there, but it looks like it's interesting reading. So thank you very much. So thank you. Thank you very much, Rezin. That was a, a great presentation. Um, we have a few minutes for questions. And um, I'm, I'm sure you're looking at the chat box. There's a question from Loredana Zodan. I, um, I want to believe that you can be able to see it, but I can also read it. What 
what is opinion if all midwife in Ireland would study and become advanced mid midwife practitioner? Do you think the service to women will improve? I think it would be great. And like I said, we're just trying to, at the moment, um, expand the midwifery led model of care. So the midwives working as autonomous practitioners. So some units around the country, so there's 19 maternity units in Ireland are working at that and some are just developing it. And currently there are 12 um, candidate advanced midwife practitioners going through the programme to set up um, and expand the midwifery led models of care within their units. So that's exciting. Um, and it would just make such a difference, you know, just that kind of working at that, that level offering the choice and then linking in with the obstetric team because absolutely we do need them um, and just sort of flowing it more. But what the women traditionally kind of have lacked here is not that midwifery model, not that input, not that health promotion bit. And that's the bit that I think that we could we can change to make a difference. Okay. The other one that I see there, I see right. Sheila there is just acting about interpartum. I forgot to say that. No, I don't do interpartum care. And um, we looked at it and we looked to see if we'd do that, but that would mean probably 30 to 40 ladies a year. And the actual service needs analysis look to just kind of trying to change bits. So if I do have ladies that are coming to me that need induced, I will come in, I'll do their induction, but hand it over and liaise them with the core labour ward staff who, who provide the interpartum care. At the moment, the service has been a bit disjointed because our antenatal clinics have been away from the main hospital. So before that, I was certainly more of a presence on labour ward, but now I, I'm lucky if I'm up there once a day. Um, but it's it's getting that bit. And, you know, before I was maybe downstairs in the clinic, if somebody needed sutured and none of the midwives in the labour ward sutured, I'd go up do the suturing. I'd quite often be the second midwife in at the birth if there was any of my ladies in birthing. But that isn't as fluid and joined up in the last year just because of COVID and the restrictions. Hopefully that answers your question, okay. Sheila. There's another question here. Was there a comparison of RAMP and other midwives? Um, because that service is so limited, so traditionally through the midwifery antenatal clinic, there's about 10% of the whole caseload come through. They only provide the antenatal care. They don't flow back into the wards and everything. So what I would do is I would gather the stats from them and do birth outcomes in that and for within them, the vaginal birth rate tends to be similar to the MP birth rate and emergency sections. And then obviously the inductions and that don't kind of come into it because they would fall into my stats. Um, and just we're hoping that we have got now a CMM2 waiting to go into post to roll out sort of midwifery led care and early transfer home. So she's going to be rolling out that midwifery led service within the unit and hopefully in the next few years, then we'll see an extra change with that. So that will be following ladies from the clinic into part and postnatal and going home. So that'll be interesting and really exciting. Looking forward to all that happening. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Um, there's a couple of more questions, but I think we, we have some little time to take one or two. There's one from uh, Iska uh, who's, who's saying, considering the importance of advanced midwifery model of care, why are many hospitals still keen on OLC, um, uh, especially private hospitals? I think a lot of it is that it is recruitment. It's the training and it's also then just getting the local service need. Because I have to say, when I started the journey, I saw my vision was my supervising consultant obstetrician shared that vision, but we hit many walls on the way. And even down to there was one stage I was just going to leave. And the lady that's practice development that coordinates all that, I remember phoning her and said, look, that's it. And I remember her saying to me, Roisin, you signed a contract as a candidate AMP. Your job description is to get registered as an AMP, so suck it up and get on with it. So I sucked it up, I got on with it, and that's where I am now. But I think that's you really need to be committed. It's it's a it's a it's a steep pathway, it's a steep learning curve, and it's just trying to get everything into place and just get the agreement locally to put it into place and to practice at that level. So I think that's why it's kind of slow to take off. And I know last week, I think it was, I tapped into a conference from the UK and they were talking about advanced practice and they're similar. They're small, but I'd say beginning to start going to grow in leaps and bounds as well. Okay, thank you. Lots of comments, um, great presentation. 
uh, you've done a good job. It's, it's it's lots of accolades. Um, there's one more here that I'm seeing. Does Ramp have more autonomy than other midwives? Um, I don't know if there's more autonomy than other midwives. Um, you would like if you're working as a midwife, you've got that full, you know, package of care and decision making for your ladies. And I know the midwife rules in the UK have changed, but when I was tra training there, I think it was rule 30 and anything out with the norm, you have to escalate care up to. And similar to me, so out with my inclusion criteria and my guidelines. So if I come across something that I haven't got that skill set or I'm not quite sure. So for example, a lady coming to the clinic, her blood pressure's up, we've done her bloods. She's now showing that maybe her urea is 3.84. She's 36 weeks. She might have come back to my clinic and we've done those. I link in with the consultant, uh, consultant obstetrician at the clinic and say, look, what are we going to do? Now, sometimes it'll be a case of, look, the blood pressure's fine. Roshan, keep an eye on this lady twice a week. If there's anything untoward, come back to me. Or it could be, right, okay, let, let's decide we're going to induce her. So you've got that kind of flow way through um, and that immediate access to the consultant. So for that, yes, I've got extra clinical decision making around the ladies that I'm caring for, but there is a limit within that. And then I report back to the consultant from that. So hopefully that answers what, what the question that the person is asking. Okay. Um, I, I don't think there's any more questions. And um, I want to believe we're all comfortable now. Um, and thank you once again, Rosine. That was a great presentation. The accolades, like I've mentioned, are awesome. Yeah. Good job. And I think the other bit that I didn't say is I think from this um, study and looking at it, what the next step is looking forward to is to try see then as the community model and the midwifery care model comes into play and we have that kind of home from home room that there will be more people thinking within that and not automatically doing the artificial rupture of membranes. And I mean, so many ladies sit at my clinics and say, oh yeah, but once they break my waters, I'll, I'll labor. So you know, once I'm in there, I'll get them to break my waters and I'll have the baby then in no time. So it's changing the women's mindset, changing the midwives mindset. And it'll just be interesting to see if that changes a lot of things moving forward as well. Okay. Thank you very much, Rosen. Um, thank you once again. Uh, thank you all for being around and just um, a few more slides and then we can um, get to the end of, of, of the session. Um,